that was incredible. And I get the challenge of trying to transition to speaking after that. So let's pray. <laughs> Father God, oh my goodness. I, I'm just so grateful that you see us and that you watch over us and that we know that you are faithful and trustworthy in your love and relationship to us. Thank you for just blessing the vocal cords of uh, Nisha and of Diane to lead us like this. Be with this message today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to continue uh, today in our series, He uh, uh, Faithful Together. And we're, we're starting out this whole year with a three-month focus on Faithful Together. But in the beginning for this first month, before we talk about us being faithful with one another, we're focusing on Him. Because we know how to be faithful to one another because He was faithful to us. So you can go ahead and flip over in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. And what we're going to uh, do today is we're going to look at a couple themes from the Old Testament. But first, I just want to look at this touch on this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because this is where we see this language. And Paul has this amazing statement. But in verse 13, he says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And thank God that he remains faithful. Because don't we waver? Don't we doubt? Don't we question? We can all remember times in our lives when we were faithless. But thank God that even though we find ourselves in moments when we're faithless, he always remains faithful. And so what we're, we're going to do, we're going to look at these two themes throughout the Old Testament. And uh, the way we're going to do this, you know, the, the last two weeks we focus on the Old Testament. And then the next two weeks, we're going to focus on the faithfulness of the Spirit and the faithfulness of Jesus in the New Testament. And this is kind of a transition message. So first, we're going to talk about the promised land and how God's promises are greater than our perceptions. And then we're going to look at, and we're going to continue on in the, in the biblical narrative, and we're going to talk about the promised king and how God's faithfulness is greater than our faithlessness. And then we're going to close out with uh, talking briefly about Jesus, the fulfillment of God's promises, and that Jesus is king. And so let's, uh, we're going to start here in Numbers 13 with this idea that God's promises are greater than our perceptions. Well, let's open up our Bibles and go run, grab your Bible from your book bag or from your uh, bedroom or wherever it is. We're going to be reading some scripture, and uh, we're going to start here in Numbers 13. And up to this point, what has happened has been God's people were, you know, slaves in exile, um, slaves in Egypt, and then God had brought them out of Egypt. They had gone to Mount Sinai. God had given them the law. And then God had marched them right up to the promised land. They actually weren't supposed to stay in the desert that long. And then here we see God comes to them and says, hey, before you go into the promised land, send some people to just check it out first. See how amazing it is. And that's how, where we're going to pick up in Numbers 13 and verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. And so God comes to Moses, Moses to send these guys into the, the promised land. But wrapped into those two little verses is a very old promise. He said, send men to explore the land of Canaan, which... I am giving to the Israelites. It's a very old promise where it's, that started with Abraham. Let's actually put your tassel right here in Numbers 13. Flip over to Genesis chapter 15. I want us to track this promise and see if God is faithful to it. Because this, this promise started out to Abraham. And when in Genesis 15 is when God steps up a covenant with Abraham. And he first tells him he's going to bless his descendants. And they'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand in the seashore. And in response to that, verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord. Of Genesis 15, verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. But God also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. 
And then again, he gives the same promise in verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I give this land. And it's amazing that through scripture, God repeats this promise again and again and again. He gives it to Abraham, then he gives it to Isaac, then Jacob, then Joseph. And now in Numbers 13, he's given this same promise to Moses that he originated with to Abraham. It's incredible. So let's see what happens. Jumping back to Numbers 13, let's go back to your tassel. So they send these spies, these 12, these 12 different leaders from the different tribes. And they put on their Door of the Explorer hats. They put on, you know, their Indiana Jones shoes. They come together like the Fellowship of the Ring. And they go on this great expedition for 40 days. And they, they see how fertile the land is. And they even take some of this amazing fruit with them back. But then they also see the people living there. And let's see their report after this great expedition of what they say to Moses and the Israelites. In verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we certainly can do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, man, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored They said, this land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. And they spread this report to all the Israelites. They said, man, we went up there. We were like the Looney Tunes. They were like the Monstars, man. We can't take those guys. How can, they're huge, So what happened though? Because they spread this report that they can't take over the land and that generation never saw the land, even though this was promised from God. So what happened? You see, their perceptions took over, uh, they focused more on their perceptions than the promises of God. They trusted their their perceptions more than the promises of God. And when they were in this land, they trusted their eyes and what their eyes perceived was reality more than the promises of God. Where they saw these Hercules looking folk and they thought there's no way, and they believed with their own, their own thoughts instead of trusting in God's thoughts and God's promises. And so sure enough, they, they didn't see that land. But is God's promise over? No. What else happened? If we continue in the biblical narrative, what ends up happening is th- that generation wanders around the desert, you know, it, during the rest of Numbers and Leviticus. And then in Deuteronomy, God led his people right up to the promised land again. And Deuteronomy is one big speech from Moses where he's reminding Israel of all the great things God has done for them. And then in the book of Joshua, do you know what the book of Joshua is about? The whole book of Joshua is about God's fulfillment of this one promise. The entire book. So from Joshua 1 down to uh, 13 is about God driving out those Hercules looking people because he can do that. And he drives them out so the Canaanites, so that the Israelites can come in. And then Joshua 14 through 22 is God's fulfillment and he gives them this promised land. When he goes through each and every single tribe, to give them each their allotted land. And it wasn't just recorded that God gave them the land. I mean, it took six chapters in scripture to explain all this because God wanted his people to know for all time that I follow through on my promises. And if you look in Joshua 23, flip over there with me. In Joshua 23, it's this powerful speech of Joshua. Joshua 23 and 24 is one of my uh, favorite speeches in the Bible. But in there is this one verse that sums all this up. After what is, what everything has happened, and Israelites doubting, can God follow through on his promise? Can he give us this land even though these people are there? And he sums all this up in this, this verse right here in verse 14. Because Joshua's about to die. And he says, now I am about to go the way of all the earth. But you know with all your heart and soul that not one 
of all the good promises the Lord your God has given you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled and not one has failed. This is amazing. I mean, who is this God that you know, through different generations, through different countries, through different times and all through different peoples, that his promises always come true. This is incredible. Why are we talking about this, though? Because we just came off of 2020. And if we're honest, I think 2020 hurt a lot of our faith. And I think 2020 made some of us doubt and question God and question, does he still see me? Does he still care? Does he still love me? But I want us to look at what God has done in the past to remember what he can do now. Because I want to stand before you and declare with all of my heart and all of my soul that God's faithfulness to you will never fail. His love is trustworthy. His grace for you will never fail. His blessings for you will never fail because he is faithful. And we see this through these stories. And I want to continue in this narrative because we continue to see this throughout all the Old Testament. And so if we continue, the next point I want us to focus on is how God's faithfulness is greater than our faithlessness. And, and if you continue through the story, so now the people, the Israelites, they have the land in Joshua. And, but then the question is, well, who's going to lead us? And God says, well, I, I'll be your king. I'm your leader. And, and so throughout the book of Judges, what ends up happening is whenever the, the, the people need a leader to step up, well, he will appoint a judge for such a time as this, but he's always their great king and they never have a king. And so that's when you see, you know, Samson as a judge or Deborah as a judge, or you see Gideon as a judge. And then that goes into one of the last judges, you know, Samuel, into 1 Samuel. And if you want to flip over there with me to 1 Samuel, we're going to see the people are getting a little fed up with the way the leadership has been going in Israel. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 8, in verse 4, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel Ramah. He was the last prophet or the last uh, judge of Israel. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Now listen to them. This, this is a scary time in Israel. I mean, they're rejecting God as their king. And you know, in our household right now, our son Cam has started to reject some of our instruction, okay? I'll just give a little update on the Massey household. We're, we're doing great. If you haven't heard, we're expecting our new baby. We're due in June. We're super excited about that. We figure out the sex in a couple weeks, be praying for a healthy baby. And uh, you know, Cam is a little over two years old. We were hoping for the terrific twos, but that's not quite what we've gotten. And then when we tell this boy to do things, it's, some things coming out of his mouth, I don't know where he learned it from, all right? It's just, no, I don't want to. I want to play with my trucks. Everything's about trucks. But, you know, I don't want to do that right now. And the worst way he rejects our instruction is we'll tell him to do something, and then he'll go against the wall, and he'll turn around, and he'll act like he can't hear us. And then Cam come do something, he'll be just... And, and then he'll put his head down as if, if he can't see us, we can't see him. And like, he doesn't, but he's rejected these things. But in those moments, whoo, baby, I have some things in my heart I want to say to that boy. And it, are you kidding? You know, but I can only imagine if everything I would want to say to Cam in those moments, if I was God right now, 
when Israel is rejecting me, I, good thing I'm not God. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Do you not know what I've done for you? Let me just recount Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Do you not remember what I did of Joseph from Egypt to take care of you guys? Then the promised land, then the law, then Moses, then all these. I'm going to wipe you off the face of the planet. Who do you think you are? But that's, that's not how God responds. Because the question of, is this the end between the Israelites' relationship with God would have been a very real question in this moment. They're rejecting him. Yet even though they were faithless, God remained faithful. Even though the Israelite king started because of their unfaithfulness, God is going to bless Israel through the kings because of his faithfulness. Let's go check out when this happens. It's over in 2 Samuel. So if you go to 2 Samuel, um, you'll see this. And what's happened is that God has raised up Saul as king. And Saul at first is a great king, but then he disobeys the Lord, is unfaithful. So then God raises up David. And David's different. David's a man after God's own heart. David's faithful to the commands of God. And so in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, we're going to see this promise that God makes to David out of faithfulness. In 2 Samuel 7, God comes to David and he says, when you're, he's talking to King David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Pause there for a second. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Solomon, right? And this would have been an easy promise to, okay, I think I can see God raising up the next, per, the next son of David who's already alive, Solomon. I could see him raise him up and help him become king. And I could see him help, helping Solomon to build a temple. Like, I, okay, I could see that one happen. But check out the rest of this promise. The rest of this promise is crazy. And then, uh, in, in 13b, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. And check out verse 16. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Forever, forever, ever, for never, ever, uh, forever, right? And this is a crazy promise. I mean, even now we look back and we see, man, okay, let's think about all the different countries and great kingdoms that have existed. Alexander the Great with Greece, up and down. Rome, up and down. Napoleon Bonaparte, up and down. Mongolian, Mongolian the Mongolian the Great. Attila the Hun, up and down. I mean, it's just a kingdom forever? Are you kidding me? Even during that time, they would have thought, well, Egypt's kind of come up and down. Babylon's kind of gone up and down. I mean, how is a kingdom supposed to exist forever? I guarantee the Israelites would have doubted this. What about when they're in exile? Where, where's God's promises now? I mean, we don't even have a king. We've been conquered, right? Even a promised land anymore. How is God going to establish his kingdom through the line of David forever? Or if we fast forward over into the New Testament, and you can flip in your Bible, so Luke chapter 1, and you, and you think about it, they've been conquered by Greece, and then they're in the New Testament. Now Rome has taken over. And Rome has taken over all the known world, and Rome rules in Israel. And a king, a, a, the line of David does not sit on the throne anymore in New Testament times. In, in the Gospels, it's this guy called King Herod. He calls himself King Herod the Great, Right? And the Jews didn't pick him. Rome picked King Herod, even though he's not a line of David, to lead and be the king over Israel. I'm sure the people were, is God ever going to come through on his promise? I mean, how is it going to be forever when the line of David is even on the throne right now? But let's see what God does. And you, in the same way that God usually does something absolutely incredible to the people that least expect it. We see that when God comes to the Virgin Mary. And in Luke chapter 1, I know we know this story, but I want you to check the language that the angel says to Mary. Luke 1. But the angel said to her in verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great 
and you will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow. God comes through on his promises. After all this time, after a thousand years, the angel comes to Mary and says like the same thing that God said to David a thousand years earlier. That this is, this is in the line of David and he will sit on David's throne and this kingdom will last forever. This throne will last forever and it will never end. And God comes through and he says, look, I'm going to establish this in Jesus. Grab your Bibles. I'm not going to show this on the screen in Matthew 1. Because I just want you to see it in your own. Man, I love this stuff. In Matthew 1, in verse 1, check this out. It's the very beginning of the New Testament. You know, so all this is Old Testament, 1,500 years of God speaking to man. And then when it transitions into this new promise, this New Testament, let's see how it starts. Genesis 1.1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah the son of David, the son of Abraham. And it goes through this long list of genealogy. And usually, if we're honest, this is kind of boring. When does the real stuff start? Like, that's how we usually see this. Why? But why? Why would the Holy Spirit inspire the gospel writers, inspire Matthew, to start with this phrase? That to start with, he is the son of David. Why? Why? Because God for all time is saying, look, before you can believe all these new promises I'm going to give you, before you can believe everything I'm about to give you in this New Testament, you have to see that I have come through on everything I have promised in the Old Testament. That when I told David that his kingdom would last forever, you see this coming forth in Jesus, that this Jesus is the son of David and he will now reign forever. We can believe that God is faithful now because he was faithful then. Because God was faithful in the Old Testament, he will be faithful in the New Testament. And I love this. I love that we hold that Jesus is up in heaven and he is reigning forever. And his kingdom will not end because Jesus is truly king. And I love how we unite about this at North River. I love that we we unite around Jesus being king. Because we as disciples are united with one heart and with one mind around one central, all-encompassing thought. That Jesus is Lord. And every time we say that Jesus is Lord, we are reaffirming God's faithfulness. We are reaffirming that he has proved faithful to his promise to David and to us now. You see, those three words are not just another sentence to us. When we say those words, it's not just lip service. Those three words mean everything. It commands the allegiance of our hearts, the allegiance of our minds, the allegiance of our strength, and the allegiance of our very souls. Jesus is Lord is the definition of who we are. It is our great proclamation. It is the ultimate hill that we make a stand on. It is our stance on everything. And it is ultimately what we unite upon. You see, we can unite in his kingdom from no matter where we're from. And we unite no matter what backgrounds we're a part of or what ideologies or what worldviews or what cultures, no matter where we're from, we are able to unite upon this one simple proclamation of our hearts. Because at our very core, I and you are the same. Because Jesus sits on the throne of our hearts. So let us come together and let us throw off everything that hinders and recommit to being faithful together. Not because anything that we agree on in this world, but because we agree on what is eternal, that Jesus is Lord. And we can be faithful to each other because he was faithful first. Where do we find the strength to love one another and be united with one another. Well, it's because we see that he has been faithful to his love to us. 
and to be united to us? Where can we find the strength to, to give our faith and to fight together? Because he has first given his faith and to fought for us. And this is what we proclaim, to be faithful together under King Jesus. So what I want to do is I want to close out with a couple of practicals. And then, um, and then we'll close out here. So there's, there's a couple of practices to do personally and then with your family discussion. So first is to make a list of 10 promises in Scripture and to write them down. And to go find those promises, write them down, and then take some time personally to pray over those promises and to reaffirm in your hearts that God is faithful to those promises. And then lastly, I just put here, have a family group discussion on God's faithfulness this week. So what we're going to start doing after every Sunday going forward over the next two and a half months, we're going to be giving out a family group discussion on the lesson from the week. And so uh, it's going to be made available on our website, uh, you know, every Sunday evening. You just go on our website, you kind of scroll down to what's happening, and you'll see Faithful Together. You click that, you can go to the lesson, find a family group discussion. Because we realize, guys, that on Sunday mornings we love hearing the Word of God. God preach, but what that does is it gives us the direction. But it's up to us in our small groups, in our one another relationships, in our family groups to really be faithful together, to talk about these things and to take them deeper. Why do we do this? Because we believe that God's promises are greater than our perceptions and that God's faithfulness is greater than our faithlessness. Amen.